Uh, good evening. Uh, I am playing. Uh, I'm going to be uh, playing the role of mayor tonight, as uh, uh, Mayor Paulson is not here, and uh, we are reconvening from a closed session um, and uh, checking with city manager. We have no reportable action. Is that correct? Sure. Okay. We have no reportable action, and with that, uh, we will uh, close our 5:30 meeting. And now we will reconvene with our regular meeting. Uh, can we start with a roll call, please? Councilmember Carroll? Here. Councilmember Way? Here. Vice Mayor Kendall? Here. And Mayor Paulson is absent. Thank you. And with that, uh, let us uh, start with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands. The next item uh, is public comment. Uh, if anybody from the public, either on Zoom or here in the audience, uh, would like to comment on something not on today's agenda, now would be the time. Uh, feel free to come. Uh, first, we'll start with uh, people in the audience here. If anyone has anything not on the agenda, feel free to come up and make a comment. And seeing no one, I will go to Zoom. Uh, do we have anybody in Zoom with their hand up uh, wanting to make a public comment? No, we do not. Okay, I will close public comment. Uh, we have uh, the next item on the agenda is presentations and proclamations. We have a presentation from the Larkspur Chamber of Commerce. Uh, is there somebody here who's going to be doing that? Okay, come on up. State of change. <laughs> uh, we we had some uh, some change in June. Our board unanimously voted to part ways with our executive director. Uh, with this move, we immediately changed the tone and the tenor of the organization, moving this in a positive new direction. Uh, we also, as you know, lost uh, Kevin Farah as he was part of the council. Uh, so we're moving strategically and methodically in, in a new direction. We're trying to do it in, in three phases. Uh, first phase was to try and have a uh, a uh, smooth transition. So that took a little bit longer than we had told us, but uh, we now collected everything we need and moving on to uh, bigger type of things. One of the things we're working on is the wine walk. So that is in um, in uh, its late stages. Uh, we we have the website. Excuse me. Uh, brought on the new chamber dashboard, Chamber Nation, which is a nationally recognized uh, uh, company. Uh, so when, uh, we're in the um, process of excuse me, uh, building that. Yeah, my name's that. <laughs> building that out to better serve the community. We'll have a monthly member. Uh, featured member on our website will be able to reach out quicker and easier to our members. Um, and we plan on having more events. So we're starting with the wine walk. We had to, um, one of the reasons we're going so methodically and, and diligently and strategically is because the wine walk was our main purpose. And so uh, to, the website's been revamped. Like I said, we have event right up. Uh, Tickets are ready to be sold. We've already sold uh, over 20 so far. So we're raising money for the wine you know, walk. We're raising money for the selling uh, tents that will be in the middle of the street. We shut down the streets. Everything uh, to date is uh, all boxes you check. We've got, I think, 24 wineries, 24 wineries uh, that will be uh, presented to us. And that's just one of the events that we're trying to work on. We've hired a uh, lift. With our budget kind of freed up with the executive director, we've also hired uh, two event planners, one of which has presented us with a second event in winter. So we kind of want to get past the, the wine walk uh, and get that in our, our region here before we, we have another event. But we do want to have more um, mixers. So one of our event planners will be strictly for mixers. I want to have a deep in the The second thing that being a winner. Already, I'm going to have a third part of the So, 
So one of the other things that we have uh, we're rebuilding is our social media site too. So we can actually start to add more value to our members and our businesses around, uh, around town. We'll be able to, with the new website, we'll be able to have, I don't explain this, each of our members uh, will be able to have a store card and be able to sell on our website and be able to link easily be able to promote local businesses, local businesses that are having events on the chocolate center in downtown. <laughs> One of the other details would be that part of the e commerce dialogue. Yeah. Hi everyone. I'm Jay Holland. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me to meet you. Uh, one of the other elements of the website that we're really excited about is the ability to sell large brand merchandise on the site. Subject to every approval and required approval of uh, but we think it will give us money revenue that we can help them improve their area of the city. I think that what we've done to change this dynamic of the chamber is that enthusiasm that we really I've personally been to every single retailer from uh, uh, Perry's up to Mike Shop and introduce myself and a new idea about the chamber. And we re energize the enthusiasm for the community. Uh, we plan to have a minimum four events a year. By virtue of this new relationship with an event fund, and all guidance for the community, uh, uh, the has the same. Thank you. And Jay, here before you uh, leave, question. Um, what can, first of all, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that uh, things are moving in, in, in a good direction. Uh, what can we do to support you? Share something a little with some clarity for you, and uh, uh, so it's crystal clear. We're still in the midst of, of what was a pretty harrowing experience to gather together the uh, the wine. Uh, it, based on my research on foot, we probably wouldn't have been, wouldn't have had a wine had a wine farm if we not made some of the changes that we made. Uh, Many of the retailers were misinformed, they were unclear about things. So rather than share some things right now that might create haze or further promote haze, we'll step back and I'll give you a, a better answer to that question. Perfect. And please just keep in mind moving forward, we want to be you know your partners on this and you know whatever we can do to support you, please just let us know. Okay. Very supportive, very patient with us. And I feel confident we're going to prove to you that this new chamber, this new iteration, is going to be more successful than It's fantastic. Any, any questions? Are you, st are you still seeking volunteers for September 9th Wine Walk? Sure. Do you take community volunteers for that? Or is there a... Okay. Is there a place on your website for them to reach out to? Uh, there's not, but I can put that up and make it explain. Okay. So we, we take it over the, uh, the website, and like I said, we dance it, and we can add things on the fly. We don't have to have, we don't have to go through a third party. So we put today all the participating wineries oh, great. on there. We have all the sponsors on there. We have the link to uh, uh, Eventbrite. Uh, so I can put in there something. I don't know what we're going to well, do. Well, you talk it over, but I, I'll volunteer, so. Yeah something on there uh, but just so you know since uh june since the soul transition started we have added members uh, we've added 10 new members at county um so this is a very positive thing for us it's totally new tone to the board so there's a lot more excitement as you and i thought um so we're really excited to get this thing um this event on books so a lot more transparency let us know um what you need from us and i can then you we'd like to be part of these meetings and provide more transparency on membership and, and how uh things are going for us to that's so appreciate it 
one answer to your question how can you help we've got a link that we can send to you or whoever you subscribe that describes what the wine walk is when it is where it is all the wineries that are involved and we're asking everyone that's interested to send it out to their Netflix. All the retailers that are willing, and there are a number of them so far, are sending it out to their database. So uh, that would be a great assistance. Okay. So how soon will you be sending stuff out? Because I'm a chamber <coughs> member. I mean, I paid for my membership, but I don't recall receiving any emails and recently. Oh, okay. That's why. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. No, I'm just curious. What we discovered in this small transition is that we have several different software programs at work. Yeah. And so this dashboard is going to bring everything together. So we're going to have a CRM. Is this the standard, uh, like Sausalito Chamber has? Is that the, that same? It's similar to the uh, OK. Really quick and then yeah, it's very dynamic. It's a very dynamic website. If I can understand it, it's good. And without having to ask my grandson. Okay, though, we have a database of numbers. Yeah. Anything we can do to help? We're here. You know where to find us. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, that was uh, the end of item three, presentations and proclamations. Item number four is the consent calendar. Uh, I believe uh, staff has already pulled item 4.5 from the consent calendar. Uh, I'll ask our city manager to uh, explain a little bit about that. Yes, so some folks may still have copies of the agenda that show item 4.5. We did remove it um, when this process for this contract came to resolution, it actually ended up being a dollar amount that uh, was in my signing authority. So we went ahead and executed the agreement. It didn't need council approval and we've already got that contractor moving along. So with that, the balance of the consent calendar is yours, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, ask council, would anybody on council like to pull any of the members from the consent calendar? Okay, asking members of the public in the audience, in the chamber, so is anybody would like to pull an item off the consent calendar? Hearing none, asking uh, on Zoom, is there anyone on Zoom who would like to pull an item off the consent calendar? There are no hands raised. Okay, uh, with that, I will take a motion for approval of the consent calendar. I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. Okay, I don't believe we need roll calls anymore. So can we just, uh, uh, Mr. City Manager, can we just take a vote? You can just call for all in favor, Mr. Vice Mayor. All in favor, uh, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, it passes 3-0. <clears throat> Next item on the consent calendar is the City Manager's oral report. Uh, I'm very excited this evening to uh, introduce a new member of our team. Um, if two heads are better than one, then we're going to be really rocking and rolling for the next several months because uh, I'm very appreciative that the council authorized us to recruit and have an administrative services director come in uh, to, as our new person while our current administrative service director was present. So Kathy Orm, who you've worked with for several years, uh, her successor is now on board, Amelia Gabrielle, who I see has come up to the mic because I was just told her she had to do more of an introduction of herself. Um, but we essentially, for the next several months, we'll have two people working together, which I think will result in a very positive transition of one of our most important functions. And Amelia, I'd love for you to take a few minutes, just introduce yourself. Uh, council members, I'm Emilia Gabrielle, the new Administrative Services Director. I was appointed on the 7th, August 7th, and I'm very excited to be here, and I'm very excited to serve the community of Larkspur and to work with the wonderful staff member that are here at the City of Larkspur. So again, thank you so much for introducing me, and thank you for your time. Thank you I'm very much. Really excited to have you. And... Uh, other than that, just uh, very appreciative right now. I think we're transitioning to the end of our season at Piper Park, and I uh, was out there the other day. It didn't take quite the beating it has in years past. So thank you to all our residents and users. Um, 
And uh, I understand Lucille was here on Friday for the close of the Giants camp, pretty exciting. So uh, uh, kind of a nice conclusion to the summer as we transition heading into school. And then that brings me to my last point, just a reminder to folks, our parking program around Redwood High School kicks in once school starts. And so school is starting next week. And so we will be enforcing the parking program in the two neighborhoods where we have that boundary set up. So that's in portions of the Larkspur Marina neighborhood and portions of the Heather Gardens neighborhood, particularly along William. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> closing the city manager's oral report, uh, council members oral report. Would uh, any of our council members like to give an oral report? It's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon. Everybody seems to be canceling meetings for, because of vacations or lack of forums. Uh, so the only one I really have is um, Transportation Authority and Marine Transit. Um, there's a real problem um, with the Muirwood shuttle, which we're involved with sort of existentially. They're running it out of um, the ferry on weekends. They ended the weekday shuttle um, last Friday. And the reason being was because in the past we were using school bus drivers and MV transportation vehicles um, for the weekday shuttle and the drivers would have to quit in August to go back to retraining on their new routes for the school year. It's not a lack of tourists, it was a lack of drivers. But this year they switched to Bauer Transportation which is using San Francisco drivers and their equipment but they're still ending the weekday service, uh, which there's at least another month or two of tourist season to go. So it's uh, that's all disturbing to me. But what really is upsetting me is finding out that they're using um, Measure AA sales tax money, which is paid for by Marin County residents and um, customers. Uh, for low, it's supposed to go to the local transportation projects and it's subsidizing the tourist shuttle and in no way serves either the employees or any of the residents on the routes. Um, and I find that objectionable. So um, I'm continuing to raise questions about that in the future. And I may be bringing something back to the council to ask for a letter. Uh, it's the program will be running now until um, September, October, and then there will be a, an evaluation in November. But I'm, I'm really objecting that we cut two of the bus services in Larkspur earlier this year for lack of funding, and yet we're subsidizing tourists with local tax money. And that just does not make sense to me. If the park service was paying for it, I would have no objection, but I don't understand why we're using local money that's supposed to be going to local residents and uh, bus users. So that's some issue that'll be coming on our radar in the next month or two. That's it. Uh, I had two things and I, I apologize that I can't find the right date on one of them, but you might know it, uh, the city manager might know it. Um, Project Home Key on South Elysio um, is wrapping up its construction and is will be hosting a community open house. And I know, um, I think it's on Thursday, the August 24th, if you if I had that right, I was just trying to look it up, but maybe we'll get that by the time I'm done. They're um, having electeds come first to get a walkthrough on, at 3.30, and then it'll be open to the public after that. So those of you who are very interested in the Project Home Key project, which is on um, 1251 South Eliseo, you can mark your calendars for that. Um, second is I'm, uh, oh, did you find the right date? It's August 30, Wednesday, August 30. 30th. Uh, the public uh, open house portion starts at 530. Great. Because I know there's been um, a lot of members uh, members of the community who are interested in seeing how that project is coming along. So that will be open to the public. And then we got an, a separate invitation to come a little earlier. Uh, second thing is I am uh, will be attending the Marin Wildfire Protection um, Agency uh, meeting tomorrow in place of the mayor since he's out of town, but I'm also a board member of Fire Safe Marin, and they are hosting what they call Wildfire Watch to discuss Maui and how Marin is um, prepared 
it, that it's on Monday, the 21st, and it's a Zoom uh, wildfire watch online at six o'clock. It's called Tragedy in Maui, a warning for Marin. So um, the uh, Jason Weber, the Marin County Fire Chief, Mark Brown, the Executive Officer of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority, and Todd Lando from Central Marin Fire will be the presenters. So um, I think they're gonna start to talk about some of the lessons that are already have been learned about um, what happened to Maui and that will be open to the public. And you are welcome to listen to that. And all that information is on Zoom uh, on the Marin Wildfire Protection Authority uh, website. Monday, tragedy in Maui and a warning for Marin. That's all. Okay, thank you both. I have nothing to report today. Uh, so I will move us to the next item, which is public hearings. We have two public hearings. First one, uh, introduce and waive first reading of Ordinance 1070, an ordinance of the Larkspur City Council amending various sections of Title 18 of the Larkspur Municipal Code related to parking to facilitate electric vehicle and accessible parking spaces and to comply with Assembly Bill 2097. Could we have a uh, staff report, please? Good evening, Council. This ordinance, this first ordinance, relates to uh, amendments to the parking regulations in the zoning code. There's five general provisions in the ordinance. One is to modify the city's parking regulations to address new state laws uh, re related to electric vehicle parking and um, that they require uh, the, the city to treat spaces that are lost to new electric vehicle charging stations a certain way. And so the proposed ordinance would incorporate these requirements into the local regulations. A second provision is a local or a, st a staff recommendation to allow sites to add disabled parking without having to um, a, get a parking variance from the planning commission just to facilitate uh, uh, business owners to bring their businesses into compliance with accessibility standards. There's also a recommendation to amend the efficiency vehicle provisions to be consistent with the California Cal Green Building Code. And we're also recommending that a, a modification to allow the community development director to determine parking requirements for certain uses that aren't listed in the parking standards, rather than have those go to the planning commission, which also is a delay for businesses. Most of the unusual uses will already have a requirement for a use permit by the planning commission, and then the planning commission would consider those parking requirements. And then the, the main reason for this ordinance is to address a 2023 new state law that limits the city's ability to require parking within a half mile of the smart and ferry stations. And so this ordinance would adopt this state law uh, essentially word for word into the zoning code. And the city is allowed to require parking for certain developments if the city can make certain findings like that it would negatively affect existing residential or commercial parking. The Planning Commission considered this ordinance on July 25th, and they made some recommendations that have been incorporated into the draft that's before you. One of the recommendations that they had was to eliminate uh, section 18.56.115E, and that was a limitation on that city ability to re require parking. Um, this the requirement that they're requesting or, or they were recommending deletion of is a provision of state law. So even if you delete it from the code, we would still be required to comply with it. And if we didn't, we'd be putting ourselves um, potentially, um, we, or we'd be essentially violating housing law to, to not follow that provision. So the draft that you have before you includes that provision that the Planning Commission had recommended not including. The city um, or staff is recommending that the city council hold a public hearing, consider the proposed amendments and introduce by title only the proposed ordinance and waive further reading. And that concludes my staff report, unless you have any questions for me. Okay, thank you uh, for that presentation. I appreciate that. Uh, let me see the staff have any questions. Go ahead. Out of 
um, curiosity. I know there's two different kinds of ADA accessible parking spaces, one that can accommodate a van lift that goes down um, and other which just accommodates a car. Um, do we have a requirement to do one or the other or both ever? I the building code has specifics as to when they're required. Hmm. So it would really depend on what the building code says based on, sometimes it's based on number of parking spaces and um, things that are outside my area of expertise. Okay. <laughs> so we don't have to define the different types of ADA. No, those, spot, it's, spots. those would all be in the, in the building code. So if, if they were required to put in a van spot, this would allow them to eliminate more parking spaces if more spaces okay. were necessary. I was curious about how uh, a business decides one or the other. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. answer that question right now. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions for staff? Okay, let me uh, open it up to the public. Any questions for staff from the public uh, in the audience here? Seeing none, uh, going to Zoom. Any questions uh, from our Zoom audience? There are no hands raised. Okay, seeing none, I will... Uh, close the uh, public comment, public hearing portion, uh, and uh, we can bring the discussion back up uh, to the dais here. Any comments? No, I think I appreciate that you went to a planning commission and you adopted some of their, some of their suggestions, because I think that's important that's been vetted that way already. So. And I think it's also important you did not accept some of the yeah, suggestions. Exactly. So thank you for using that discretion. We appreciate it. It makes our job easier. Uh, having said that, is there a motion? I move approval of ordinance 1070. Second. Okay, uh, let's uh, do a vote. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All against? Okay, motion passes 3-0. Uh, uh, checking in with staff, is there anything I need to do on 7.1 before we move to 7.2? Okay, opening up the hearing for... Uh, 7.2, which, which is to introduce and waive the first reading of Ordinance 1071, adopting amendments to Larkspur Zoning Code to make it consistent with state law requirements for family daycare homes, mobile home, mobile home parks, emergency shelters, uh, employee housing, and to uh, amend group home residential care facilities and reasonable accommodation regulations to further fair housing. Can we get a staff report on that, please? Thank you. This second ordinance is addressing uh, primarily a number of fair housing issues that were raised by the state when they were reviewing our housing element draft. And we would include them as programs in the housing element, but they're easy items to just take care of so that we don't have to have them as programs to address later. Uh, there, it's also proposed to address some state laws such as requirements to allow family daycare centers in residential districts. And some of the state laws that this address, again, don't really change current requirements because we're, we're obligated to follow the state law, even if it's not contained in the city's regulations. One of the major changes in this ordinance uh, is to address a comment by the state that they felt that the city zoning code isolates and regulates group homes for seven or more persons, since it only allows these in two districts. One is the multifamily, the R3 multifamily district, and then the second is the administrative and professional district. And just to note, the administrative and professional district currently doesn't allow any other types of residential uses. So the proposal is to allow group homes and licensed residential care facilities of any size in all districts that allow residential uses, and that would just not place them at any sort of, uh, with any sort of special requirements that aren't applied to everyone else. And this, the standard regulations, the objective standards for size and lot coverage and floor area, those would apply. So it would just limit the size of those types of facilities if someone was to propose them in a single family residential neighborhood. So the staff is recommending that the city council hold a public hearing, consider the proposed amendments to the city zoning code and introduce by title only the proposed ordinance and waive for the reading. And that would conclude my staff report unless you have any questions for me about this one. Uh, let me open it up to uh, council, any questions? Okay, I have one question just to make sure I'm understanding it. So uh, if there is uh, an area that is just zoned residential, uh, this would now change our code to allow for certain businesses uh, to be in those residential areas? 
essentially, yes, if it's like a licensed group home um, would be, it would have some characteristics of a business use and it would be allowed in a residential area. Um, but the primary characteristic would be that of a, just a residential home that has multiple residents. Got it. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. I, I just, I just thought I'd add that, um, even though I think Elise touched on this, that, that state law, even though I think from, if you look at it from one way, these are viewed as businesses, state law has basically preempted local jurisdictions from looking at them any other way than as single family residences. So the, the, Philosophically, the the changes are basically to bring them in line with this view of state law that that from a regulatory perspective we have to treat them like a residential use. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Any other questions Thanks. by council? Okay, let me open it up to uh, the public. Uh, anyone in our audience here have any questions for staff? Okay, going to our Zoom audience. Is anyone our is anyone in our Zoom audience have a question for staff? Okay, uh, can we allow our uh, Zoom listener to comment? Uh, hi, James Holmes Larkspur. Um, with respect to the group homes and the current size limitations, uh, I think an argument can be made that at some point, uh, a, a group home of some particular large size takes on more the characteristics of a commercial enterprise than a, um, a residential operation. Uh, I mean, the Tamil Pius uh, would be a, a, an example of that, that theory, although I realize it's not a group home. It's a, essentially a commercial uh, apartment uh, com com complex or, or con senior condo complex. But um, I don't know where the strike point is in terms of the number. <clears throat> we previously set it at seven. Maybe it should be slightly higher. But I do think that the idea that uh, no matter how many residents or, or how many uh, people living in it, it still retains a residential character, uh, I think that that's debatable. And so I wonder whether we have to go whole hog and do away with uh, all limits. Maybe we should just uh, raise the limits a bit. And uh, in this connection, I wonder what uh, other local communities may be doing in this regard. Uh, but uh, I think we might want to be a little bit uh, cautious here. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me ask uh, our city attorney a uh, question related to that, which is under state law. Uh, is there any number if somebody wanted to build a skyscraper of, you know, residential uh, homes in this way? Uh, is there any any limits under state law, or would everything be characterized and we'd be required to characterize them as residential? Um, well. The the proposal to I, I just sorry I, I feel like I'm often uh, uh, pulling pieces of your your questions apart but uh, oh, good. Uh, the the building the skyscraper part of it would be subject to other other it's an exaggeration right, right. but <laughs> but um, the uh, the the issue like the issue if if somebody bought an existing large house. Um, and uh, wanted to put multiple people in each bedroom. Um, the view of the state is that, that and operated as a group home, the view of the state is that, that that is something that should be treated as a residential use, even though it is being operated by a commercial operator, um, and, that the, and that the city has to um, be treated as though it's like any other residential use. Uh, I should say, though, that if there are, um, if if the operation of the group home creates public nuisances, it generates noise, trash. Um, there's disturbances to the community. This doesn't preclude the city from undertaking its normal code enforcement um, approach to address any specific issues that are created by by the poor operation of a particular group home. 
the state's just saying for the purposes of land use, you have to treat it as a single family house. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Appreciate it. Uh, are there any other uh, comments on Zoom? Okay. With that, I will close public hearing and bring it back to council. Any discussion that council would like to have on this issue? Okay. Uh, can I get a motion? I move to approve ordinance 1071. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, let's have a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All uh, opposed, say nay. Okay, uh, it passes 3-0. Uh, thank you again for uh, both of those presentations. Appreciate it. Uh, we now move to business items. 8.1, an update on the general fund reserve. Mr. Vice Mayor, Council Members, I wanted to bring you this item this evening to kind of lead you through a brief discussion about the status of the General Fund Reserve, because um, as we've been sort of signaling to you for several months, we do anticipate during this fiscal year asking you to make decisions about the use of portions of the General Fund Reserve. And I thought in advance of doing that, it would be worthwhile to give you a sense of where we are financially. Um, and there is particularly one area I'd like to seek a little bit of uh, direction this evening in terms of what I might bring back. Um, I want to first thank Kathy Orm and Amelia Gabrielle in the audience. To, uh, they both made sure that everything I put in here was correct, which is important. Um, so before I, I dive into some of the specific numbers, just a little bit of a reminder about how we operate as a as an entity and the role that the general fund reserve plays in our operation um, it's easy to look at this and go wow we're doing great and we are doing great but as the council's heard me talk about many times budgetary numbers and sort of snapshot and time numbers of what we have available to us and cash management are not always exactly the same thing and so um, it's important that i underscore that point because um, as a property tax city, a city that essentially sees its two large paychecks come in uh, in April and in December, um, we become very dependent on managing our cash flow. And the general fund reserve plays a big part in that. So how much we have in the general fund reserve from a budgetary standpoint, and then how much we have in the bank at any given time aren't necessarily the same number because we're using that cash flow that the general fund reserve gives us uh, to make sure we're paying all our bills as we move from paycheck to paycheck with the property tax. That is a big motivation for why Larkspur and many of the other municipalities that are similarly structured financially have a fairly high uh, general fund reserve requirement, a baseline requirement. We have 25% of our operating budget should always be in the general fund reserve. And that helps us not only be ready for a rainy day, but it helps us always know we have cash that we can deal with during these uh, stretches. So um, Larkspur has been doing really well, as you know, in terms of our property values growing and our sales tax base growing. And so as a result, our general fund operating budget has been able to grow some too. That always brings a challenge, but we need to set aside 25% in the general fund reserve. But I'm pleased to say, if, if you have the report in front of you, the first item in the table is to acknowledge that we are meeting that goal. We have 5 million set aside so that we have 25% of our reserve available. And folks can go into our budget book and see you have adopted policies that explain how these reserves these emergency reserves, the 25% should be used, what constitutes an emergency when we would actually draw from that money on a permanent basis. Um, the council years ago established a policy that when we were building anything in the general fund reserve above that 25%, its primary purpose would be to be set aside for capital investment, you know, projects and infrastructure for which there are not other revenue streams available. So, um, over the years, we've managed to uh, work with our community to secure some key revenue streams for infrastructure like the roads. Uh, and now we're working on our storm drains. And so uh, what's wonderful about that is we've been able to build up some of this capital money and we can start to talk about some of our other needs. It's one of the things I wanted to sort of put a spotlight on this evening because um, we have two significant items that we'll be talking about and whether or not you wanna use some of this money this year. 
The first is whether or not we're going to want to add, potentially add community rooms and disaster uh, preparedness centers to the Rose Lane property. You know, we've asked in our process, our current process where we're soliciting proposals from the development community, what that might cost with the idea that we would have these large rooms that could serve as meeting rooms, that can serve as programming rooms, but we're also going to build them to a standard where they could serve as a disaster uh, recovery center, disaster response center, which is something we don't currently have uh, secured in our community. So potentially that's a big investment that may come out of this pot of money. So I kind of wanted to make sure you're aware that's looming. And I think we'll be asking you that question in December or January of this uh, coming uh, current fiscal year. A smaller scale need that we're going to need to talk about from this pot of money is, is this building's preliminary assessment. I'm not talking about the big picture of what we're going to do with this building and what that's going to cost, but we need to make a significant investment in terms of getting an engineering assessment and a historical architecture assessment of this building so we know exactly what we can and can't do without damaging it with respect to its historical character and to its with respect to its ability to continue to serve our community in whatever capacity uh, we, we want it to serve. So um, that's going to be a, a large project, and we do anticipate needing to ask that it come from this source of funds too. Uh, fortunately, since we last reported to you in the general fund, this is an area where we've been able to put some more money aside. So you actually had designated that we hold about 5 million with this being what it would be used for. And we actually, for a variety of reasons discussed in the report, have seen that number grow closer to 7 million. So uh, that's exciting for our community that we've uh, been prudent stewards to make sure that we would have money available to reinvest in our community. Um, the other thing that's looming that will have to be talked about in this context is um, we need to, start to figure out how we're going to close the fund that served for doing the Bonaire Bridge and all the mitigation projects. When that's all done, we'll do a reconciliation and we'll figure out if any of the general fund reserve is needed to uh, deal with any overages that we experienced in that fund. Uh, the way we managed that fund was we, we didn't really bolster it up as we experienced growth in the cost of the bridge. Instead, we kept moving the money into the general fund reserve, knowing the day was coming when we would have to have this conversation. Uh, we're, we're still doing all right in the bridge fund, but when we're done with all the mitigation projects, it's gonna be you know, kind of a number that, that may be slightly where we have to compensate it out of the general fund reserve. Can you remind me how many we have left to navigate? I mean, dog park is done, except the removal of the old. Yeah, so the first one we did was on Magnolia and that dealt with uh, yeah. dealing with where water would go and compensating for the fact that the bridge is considered right. essentially a non-permeable uh, barrier yeah. for water to travel. So we dealt with that on Magnolia. That was project number one. Project number two is the new dog park. Right. The new dog park is related to project three, which is the removal of the old dog wetlands. park yeah. and restoration of that to wetlands. Um, and then we have a number of docks around uh, Cordomadera Creek that are that we're required to now replace as part of our mitigation. So those are the projects still to come. Yeah, uh, Mr. Skinner's in the back. I, we could pick on him and have him tell us uh, that whether we are or are not almost done. Although I think he's feeling pretty good this fiscal year. We'll be wrapping up. Probably he's nodding his head for those who are online. So uh, I'm getting a head nod that we will finish our mitigation projects this year, and close that up. Um, and just, uh, I, I did want to, uh, before I open up for some specific topics, wanted to highlight a few other things. Uh, want to express your appreciation, our appreciation that you allowed us to take a million dollars and half of it we put into the general plan update and housing element fund. Uh, that's been critical. As you know, those processes have proven to be pretty daunting. Uh, Ms. Simonian's put together a great team, and uh, but the need to comply with all the demands from the state uh, has required even more investment than we had anticipated. And we are starting to, for the first time, program some of these dollars. Um, and then 
with the council's uh, approval, we've invested a lot in our technology to bring us up to speed. The most exciting one, I think, was the completion of our uh, our e-track it and central square system, which is allowing now for contractors to engage us online, get their permits online. Um, we've had a lot of interest in some of the permits we're issuing. And another great thing about it is we're now able to fairly quickly get all of that information digitized and then make it available to the public. So that's been a, a great benefit to us too. Um, as the council knows, though, behind the scenes, we've been improving our network for the first time in years, which I think is starting to pay off because we're having a lot more stability than we, we have had in the past. So thank you for approving that investment. Um, Mr. Skinner identified for you that are in the resolution that I attached, which was from a few years ago, some capital improvement projects that he felt needed to be done sooner rather than later. Um, He's done a portion of them, and we have two projects that are designated that I think he's hoping we'll be able to uh, commission this year. And there's a lot of reasons why it takes us longer than we would hope to get all these projects done. Uh, one of the reasons is that we need contractors to be available, and we go through ebbs and flows about the availability of people to do this work. And the other thing is, as the council knows, Larkspur's different regions are subject to a lot of restrictions. Uh, particularly with respect to environmental concerns. And so timing becomes really challenged and we sometimes have to prioritize which projects are gonna go through the queue first based on our needs as a community and what our restrictions are to preserve and protect our habitats that are around us. Um, and then what's really exciting in this um, uh, report is I'm pleased to say at the time that you last visited the general fund reserve, we'd asked you to make a fairly large set aside because we were concerned about potential overruns in the general fund. Our staff worked really hard to avoid all of those and we were successful in that regard. And so we have a $750,000 that we were able to keep in the reserve and didn't need to be spent. So that helps us bolster up as part of that 2 million addition to the, to the capital uh, improvement uh, area. In addition to those capital projects I talked about, the other thing we've been holding off on for several years, the council's been aware of this, is that we haven't been meeting your target goal for investing in our OPEB trust. That's our other post-employment uh, benefits trust. That's what we use to uh, make sure that we have money in the bank to meet our obligations to pass employees with respect to retiring medical benefits. It's a program that's no longer open, but um, we still have obligations uh, to people we made those promises to in the past. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to signal with this and make sure you're comfortable with is I think that uh, we'll be bringing to you sooner rather than later a proposal to put as much as $2 million into the OPEB trust to make up for the number of years that we didn't put anything in. It had been the council's goal that at a minimum we should try to put half a million dollars into the trust annually, and we really haven't done that for five years. So I think at least putting the $2 million in gets us close to what we haven't been able to accomplish, and then we'll keep working to get caught up and advance that goal. Um, because that's an obligation we want to make sure we control and have off our books so that it's not an albatross for future leaders of our community as they manage the books. So I'm hoping that's something you'll be comfortable with us to uh, bring forward in, in the coming meetings. Um, and then, as I said, I, I think we'll be bringing that infrastructure investment to you as part of discussions in January and February, particularly as we understand what our opportunities and costs are relative to our library project. Uh, with that, I got several members of the team and we're available if you have any questions or comments or turn it back to you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Okay, uh, turning to council, uh, anybody have questions for staff? Yep. Go ahead. Um, I understand what... Give me a time frame on the um, past employee benefit package. You said we haven't been contributing that half million. You think two roughly million? five years ago we established that as our goal that we would at least put half a million in, but then we ran into the issue that we realized we were going to have a cash management challenge with the bridge project. Right. Yeah. And so 
we deferred putting that money because once it's in the OPEB trust, it's locked up. It's in the trust. It doesn't come back right. out. So yeah. um, now I think we're in more of a comfortable position where we can catch up on those payments. Um, you know, OPEB is a funny thing. It's a snapshot in time of an actuary saying, given what I think is going to happen with the population of people eligible for this benefit, this is how much we think you ought to have in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, we'll do another where we're actually, I think I can probably get a head nod from Kathy back there. I think she's working now with the actuary on the next report. Uh, so we'll probably be talking about your OPEB liability sooner rather than later and where things sort of stand. Mm -hmm. um, but you have a rough number. I think it's roughly probably about 12 million for the city that we ought to have in the bank to protect ourselves against costs until the, the I'm sorry, this is how an actuary would say, until the expiration of those ex, uh, eligible for the benefit. How many employees are we talking about? I'd have to go back. It's If you go historically back, there was a time when not only employees were receiving the benefit, but so were members of their family. And so I need to go back to do a full census to give you that number. We also have, um, back when we had a fire department, we had that benefit for firefighters. Yeah. So we still have that liability, even though fires left us for past firefighters that worked for Larkspur. Okay, so we'll have those numbers within the next few months. We'll bring you a new report. The old reports are online. So okay. you, know, if I, you can definitely read through them to see how many, um, again, actually talk, how many lives are involved is, is what you would say in terms of what you're covering within the the program. Okay. Um, the other question I had was the um, the restoration of the old dog park to wetlands. Is that a contract that's already out, or is it will be going out? Or I don't believe it's out yet. I'm getting head nod. It's not out yet. Okay. Oh, it is out. I apologize. So, um, uh, is there any? Julian, involvement? you better come answer this one. <laughs> Sorry, we're gonna we're gonna bug you. <laughs> this is what you get for staying. Uh, good evening, public works director Julian Skinner. Um, yes, even though there's five individual mitigation projects, they were all bid out as one project to one contractor, mainly because it's uh, with the federal aid funding, there's a lot of paperwork with these projects. So uh, we simplified that process by bidding them all together. Um, and then there are five individual projects that all have their individual timelines that are constrained by environmental regulations. So, for example, the tidal marsh and demolishing the old dog park can't happen until September 1st because of uh, some endangered species that are there until okay. September 1st. Well, my question is, is there going to be any involvement from either the middle or the high school? Um, there's not anything planned, um, in the contract. It was all part of uh, contract work. It's all, um, I mean, there's a lot of heavy machinery. It's not something typically that we would have. We do have other smaller projects that, um, we do have public participation in. Uh, but this one, it's all, um, heavy machinery and everybody actually who is on that work site has to be trained in all of the environmental regulations and go through a process and get stickers on them so they're authorized to work. So this project's a little complicated for community involvement, but we certainly have done it on some other smaller ones in the past. Okay, I understand. Right, thank I, you. I did want to chime in though. Um, uh, when we first agreed to this project, when we were working with the regulatory agency, which I know predates Mr. Skinner a little bit, the plan from the regulatory body was that they would invite the school when it's done to work on a teaching program to appreciate the wetlands and the habitats that are in it. So while they may not be involved in our project, I suspect they'll be involved in the future enjoyment of what we restore. Okay. Uh, and I also, I'm getting a message from our, our very effective staff that there are 90 people in the, in the program right now who are receiving the retiree medical benefit. Oh, okay. Wow, wow 90. How was efficient. <laughs> yeah, we try. <laughs> can we give them bright yellow stickers? And when I'm driving around, I can. Kathy's waiting. Oh, no, no, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I'm getting corrected for my nuance. Are you, are you one of the... Uh, I will be. Uh, okay, so, yeah. So, uh, ah, so this is a particular interest. Okay. But Got Kathy's it. Kathy's reminding me that OPEB also covers your obligation for your current, your active employees. So, um, 
when the actuary is doing the calculation, there's two pieces to it. There's the part for folks who've already retired. And then there's what we're paying for our active employees to participate in our medical program. And so they actually are both lumped into the numbers. So when she's saying 90, that's the total of both those numbers. Okay. I know it might be too early to know, but 51% of our budget goes to public safety. So our Central Marine Fire and Central Marine Police, do we have any um, forecasting of what their expenses will be if going up? So at the end of this fiscal year, both labor contracts and both those joint powers authorities are expiring. So we could certainly anticipate an increase uh, based on the trend we're seeing uh, in the press, if you're reading it, and that my colleagues and I are seeing is um, be between the challenges of cost of living, recruitment, we're going to probably see those contracts are going to cost us more. Um, but there is a reality to how much money is available. And so we have to sit down and work all of that out with our unions. You know, I can tell you, we're very fortunate here. Um, our unions, public safety and non-public safety have always come to the table in a cooperative spirit. And so I go into this future discussion that's coming up um, optimistic that they'll come to have a partnership. I mean, um, they have their goals and objectives, but they understand that they also need to keep a healthy agency and a healthy community. So um, we'll be working on that, but yes, we're going to see some expense increases. Right. We also had um, equipment needs a few years back where we needed a new engine. And I think there was discussion of more squad cars or something. Just So those we've done, I, I want to commend both the command staffs because we uh, challenge management committee challenged them to create a, a robust five-year replacement program. And so those are now sort of systematically built into the budget so that we're properly preparing ourselves fiscally for those, those hits of particularly vehicles. Those are for both those agencies, those are big hits. Um, where I think we're gonna, uh, we're all gonna hold our breath and have a long, difficult conversation among leadership and then among the community uh, it has to do with the condition of the firehouses. Um, as the council knows, we've had a preliminary assessment done through Central Wind Fire of the four firehouses that serve the Twin Cities, and all four of them have problems uh, to varying degrees, and all four of them need to be talked about in terms of what level of quality do we need so that we can safely serve the community going forward. Um, in addition, we're now having what I would call part two of that analysis done, which is what services need to be out of each of those four locations to make sure that we are properly serving everyone from a coverage standpoint, because that informs how much we need to invest in each of these buildings, because we need to make difficult decisions about services. And so um, that's a really challenging conversation. It's probably a two-year process from, from where we are now till we're probably ready to make those final dollar commitments. And those are big dollars. That's gonna be a talk with the community about what we can and can't accomplish. So um, I'm looking forward to it from the standpoint of talking about how we can better serve the community. I'm probably uh, cringing a little bit about having to talk about what I think is gonna be a very expensive investment. Okay, I just have a few questions. Uh, uh, as far as uh, we're talking about the OPAB trust, uh, and what, what I guess, not a question, but more of a request, is that when we come back in the future uh, to make these decisions, uh, what I would be looking for uh, is, and I don't know if opportunity cost is the right word, but if we put $2 million in the OPEB trust, do we make interest on that? What If we use that money for other things, I know, you know, Julian sometimes uh, points out the uh, prevention, the cost of prevention versus the cost of cure. And sometimes if we don't do things in a timely way, we end up paying a lot more to fix it than if we had just prevented it. <clears throat> so uh, in making those financial decisions, those are the things that that I think about and would love uh, if those could be part of the presentation. Yeah, so when we bring you this discussion about making that investment, we will definitely bring that to you. I can give you some quick feedback now 
know, essentially uh, your OPEB liability is growth in the cost of medical coverage against diminishment in the number of participants in the program, right? So that nets you, and it's always a growing number that um, and until some date in the future when the lives that are present in the program are much lower. If you're not investing anything in the trust, you're not gaining any interest or investment money off of that trust to help offset the inflationary growth that you're experiencing in the in the liability. And so when what the actuary is trying to do is give you a number and say, if you had that number in the trust growing at a reasonable rate of return, then you would have enough money to deal with the inflationary growth in the cost of medical coverage. And so we'll bring you that as part of the OPEB study. And I encourage you and anyone who's listening to go on our website and look at some of the past studies because that's in there. That's a discussion of what they're assuming you need to achieve as a rate of return in order to defray the growth that we're experiencing. Um, and so we will definitely bring all of that to you. Uh, I can tell you if it goes into trust, you can only spend it on on this particular cost. You can't spend it on anything else. All right, thank you. And and my only other question was uh, with the potential uh, disaster relief center, you know, as part of the the new Rose Lane project. Um, that just sounds like something there should be a grant available for that it's it seems like the state would want to encourage us to have some type of emergency disaster centers and i was curious if if those are out there anywhere so one of the uh, pieces of advice that the project team that mr skinner's leading uh, has a number of experts on it is that once we if we make that decision and once we make it clear that we want it built to I forget, Julian, what the technical term is here uh, for the standard for the building. There's a certain standard you have to build to. Um, we might be able to find some money to help, but no promises, but we'd be out looking for it. But we're not quite at that point where you've decided that's part of this project. And so it's a little difficult for us to go out and see what might be available. Got it. But, but it sounds like... Uh... I, again, I, it's one of those things where if if it was presented, hey, there are some grants out there if you decide you want to do this, that might make people more likely to be in favor of it. Then if you approve it, then we'll first start looking for grants. Um, I, I, I guess I was just hoping in the the argument for, hey, let's do this because there's a shot that we can get some additional funding might help us in the court of public opinion. Yeah, so appreciate where your thought process is going. Most grants we see along these lines are what are called shovel ready grants, meaning you actually have to be ready to break ground and we're not at that point. But that might be a good question to ask Congressman <laughs> Huffman also, who represents our area, that if there are federal grant funds in the Build Back Better legislation and everything that's come down federally. so. I mean, that's what their office is valuable for, is to help us figure out where those grants may be coming from the federal government, too. You know, we, we can certainly do that. Our team looks at grant programs constantly looking for opportunities. Um, I do also, one reason we're cautious to ever say, please support us, because we think there's grants out there. Grants are not free. Grants come with a magnitude and myriad of conditions. And sometimes what sounds great isn't so great when you realize what you actually have to agree to do. And so, um, although I appreciate that people might be more supportive of the concept if they knew there were grant money, it's so difficult to commit today that we could necessarily have that and still get the project done in a timely manner. And so we may have to be deciding it knowing that we would pay for it and hope we find a grant so we don't have to pay quite so much for it. Okay, fair. Okay, those are my only questions. Uh, just checking back with council. Any additional questions? Uh, checking with the public. Any questions on this uh, item? Uh, going to Zoom, public. Any questions on this item? Okay, I will close business item uh, 8.1. With that, it brings us to business item 9, which is adjournment. Thank you all very much for a wonderful meeting. I look forward to seeing you again.